Hey, I want to talk to you today about some challenging things. Um, my first line here is, is it says, we live in increasingly difficult times. And the reality is we are in the West, you know, especially here in, in New Zealand and in Australia, we're probably wealthier than we've ever been before. I know in Melbourne it's been crowned the world's most livable city. It's, it's in a state of mourning because... Um, we, we lost the title, but we're second, you know, so, and, and, and we've had that, we had that title for several years in a row, which says something about the economy, the facilities and all of those sorts of things. But the bottom line is this, we are, uh, you, you know, way better state than ever before, um, economically, uh, with facilities, with healthcare and a whole bunch of other things. But, um, but I also believe we're in a worse state than ever before. And I know many of you, Older people will say, oh, no, you don't know what it was like when I was a boy, you know. And, um, you know, I walked 15 or 20 miles to um, school through snow and I had to beat off wild wolves. And uh, there's probably some others here who've got testimonies about how they were beaten by Ray in table tennis and <laughs> how difficult and bad that was. I, I, I don't know, you know, some of Ray's stories, they get bigger and better as time goes on, you know, but anyhow. But, but the reality is we're all getting older and it's preferable to the alternative because the outcome of the alternative is not good. But we are getting older and we do have hero stories, if you like, about how difficult things were in the olden days. You know, I remember when my kids were younger one time, they were looking at photos and they said, oh, that, uh, Dad, when did colour come into the world? Because they looked at the old photos that were black and white and they assumed that colour was... It wasn't just a change in the photo, it was a change in the whole world, that somehow the, the world in the past was all black and white. And that's interesting. You know, my father-in-law is 85 now. And um, he's, uh, so he's born in 1934. And I want you to think of some things. So as a 10-year-old, 1944, he was in London uh, in the midst of the bombing. He survived. Um, obviously, because otherwise he wouldn't be my father-in-law. <laughs> uh, but, you, you know, later on he, he uh, served in the army, just um, there was compulsory national service, I think, in Australia, and he served as a, as a medic or something just for uh, 12 months or two years, I'm not sure. But he, he would have seen nations rebuilding, you know, because after the Second World War and the loss of life and the the economic impact of that. Um, and this is where we get the name baby boomers. Baby boomers come out of the war and, and it was a time of boom, if you like, because resources were, were used to rebuild countries after all of the resources had been spent on the war. And in the 60s, you, you would have seen a bunch of different things, including uh, the war with Vietnam and um, would have seen the Jesus people and, you know, the highs and lows of the economy, the things that were shaky. I mean, he, he, he would have recalled, you know, going through the, the upset of the Watergate scandal, which was a big thing when that happened with Richard Nixon. And then into the, into the 80s, you know, in 1984, I don't know if you realise it or not, but there was what's called the planetary lineup where the world was going to end. And he lived through the end of the world. Um, Christians were gripped by the thought that the planet somehow would end up in a straight line and that would cause some catastrophe and Jesus would return and um, all of us, well, lots of us here would have lived through the Y2K thing where we thought the world was going to blow up then and, and the silly Christians all got their tin food put in their cupboard, they filled the baths with water because they thought this Jesus is returning and we know what's going to happen now. Jesus, Jesus worked it all out so all the computers would break down and the planes would drop out of the sky and he lived through all of that and... Uh, he lived through the heartache and the pain of me marrying one of his daughters. And uh, that was probably the biggest impact on his life. Uh, he's, he's, you know, he's, he's bought houses, sold houses. He's retired now. He's 85. And why am I saying all of this? Age gives you the ability to experience both challenge and the experience of overcoming. When you overcome, you build resilience. Uh, now, there, is it a marathon or a walk this morning that's going on? Does anyone? Is it, most of the people are walking. 
Sheridan and I were driving and they're walking. So there's not much resilience there because I thought a marathon was a run, you know, not a walk. Sort of like, sorry? Oh, the runners have finished. Yeah, yeah the walkers are still going. That's, that's, they'll probably still be going tonight, So <laughs> some of them. But what happens is when you go through a challenge and you overcome, you build resilience. And, um, you know, for, for runners, obviously, you can't get up today if you're not a runner and run 42 kilometres. But you can build resilience by building up the distance that you run. And eventually, you could run 42 kilometres. Most of us could run 42 kilometres if we took the time, overcome the challenges and built the resilience necessary and the fitness to do it. And I say that, and I'll come back to this in a few moments, but challenges and overcome challenges build something into us that is beneficial for us in our perspective of life. The world around about us is suffering from, I believe, significantly higher stress than it's ever experienced before. And despite the wealth that we have, um, people are suffering pressure. And you know, statistically, I'm not sure what the numbers are. Some people say one in four are significantly affected by mental health issues. Some people say three out of four people suffer some form of mental health issue at some point in their life. Whatever the numbers, they're extremely high. And when you calculate that, um, there are people around us all of the time affected by mental health issues. Keeping up with the Joneses used to be easy because uh, the Joneses were the people that lived next door and the, the theory is that you would look at the new boat or the new car that the Joneses had and you thought, oh no, now I've got to wait 12 months, then I'll get a better one than them. And it was a competitive thing. The challenge is now be, because we have Facebook and Instagram and a whole lot of other things, that sense of competitive spirit is now spread across the world. And whereas once there was the possibility of seeing the challenge of the neighbour's car and overcoming it, now it's impossible. Because it doesn't matter how much you look on Facebook, the majority of the people will probably exhibit something that you will never be able to overcome or, or, or attain. And when you think about that, and I'm no, you know, ultimately we shouldn't be comparing, but what it actually says is... Um, you're not the provider you ought to be because this family can do this or God has somehow overlooked you, therefore these people can do this. Now, we know that half of the stuff that's on Facebook is made up and they just, they give you their best story. I see some people and some of the things they put there, I think, I know the truth about you. I know that you borrowed all the money for that and you're stupid for driving that car. Um, but, but the reality is this, this impacts on all of us, all of the time. And it's no longer as simple as beating the person next door. It seems that we're in competition with the world. I want you to think for a moment for someone who's in a developing country, many of which we may connect with because of our connections with missions, they look at our life as if it's unattainable. And it's actually discouraging that the God who provided for us doesn't provide for them. It damages their faith. And, and sometimes it may well damage your faith too because you look and you envy what's going on in somebody else's life. Family life used to be the bedrock of society, but it is increasingly being beaten up. And it started in the 50s um, with changes to the way people think children ought to be parented. And I'm not saying that there, there haven't been advances that are advantageous, there are. But the family unit isn't what it used to be. Society has always been built around the family unit, but it's being destroyed um, time after time after time. And, and I know some years back, I was talking with some people in India and they were, um, they were horrified at what people could access through cable TV because it gave a picture of American society that destroyed the values of the Indian society and the connection with family and with one another. But the reality is for all of us now, it's gone, it's gone to a whole new level and, and, and it's really, really difficult to define what family is anymore. But the family used to be the safe place, the place that people could run back to for help. In the old days, you know, if 
If you, you, you know, you grew up and you got married and there was a challenge in your marriage or a challenge financially, you could go back home to mum and dad who would be able to help talk it through and work it out. It doesn't happen that way anymore. And, and so that adds an additional stress. It removes, it's the, the enemy is coming. It removes the option of getting the help that you need from a safe place. Our exposure to media has many people burdened by world issues in unprecedented ways. When I was younger, we used to get the morning paper. The morning paper would have the news usually of the previous day and it would probably have one or two pages of international news. In Melbourne, the majority of it was filled with sport because that's the highest priority. And, um, And then everything else found its way into the newspaper. But the newspaper had one edition. Occasionally, there'd be the afternoon newspaper, which might update some of the activities of the day, but it wasn't that much in it. And the only things that made the international news were the significant things. The news that we got through the day uh, in the evening was the news at six o'clock or seven o'clock or five o'clock, depending on where you were in the the thing. And, and, And you'd have the nightly news and again, the same thing. Probably two or three minutes would be devoted to international news. The majority of the news was given over to local things that have some little kid who's run his race for the first time and won the race. And there's a whole bunch of other things which made you feel nice and good. But the international news, which sometimes contains some horror, would be there. But once you viewed the news, it was gone. And so you would go to sleep having perhaps seen something in the newspaper, maybe something in the evening, and that was it. But the news cycle is now 24-7 and every one of us has news available to us all the time. And the news is no longer the news, it's, it, 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 it's a product. And the goal of the people producing this media is to get you to keep watching. And the only way they can get you to keep watching is to keep horrifying you. So what they do is they find the worst things that are happening in the world and they emphasise that so that you feel obligated to keep tied in. And the thing that keeps you tied in is your concern and your worry. You, you, you know, every one of us, if we hear that, so, that, that there was an explosion in some place, perhaps, and I'm making this up, there's an explosion in, in Wellington this morning and, you know, and a, and a building collapsed, everyone would worry. And what they would do is they'd go to the news outlet to get some relief or some answers or whatever. But if you then also find there was another one in Christchurch and then another one in Auckland, what happens is you keep going back to the news And the way the media works is they keep doing this to you, but what you don't realise is happening is your emotions are mixed up in every one of those articles to some degree or another. There's concern, there's worry, there's stress. And I think we're at a stage now where we were never built to take the information that we receive or to carry the burden of the news in the way that we do. And we say we, we, we live in in much better times in many ways economically, but when it comes to carrying a burden, the burden we carry because of the opportunity of media is much greater than it's ever been. I remember, and it was probably a year or two ago, there was some significant outbreak of violence in Nigeria uh, with Muslims um, attacking Christians again, and so many people were killed, and I read it, and, and it didn't really have any effect on me, which worried me as well. Um, It didn't drive me to prayer. It's sort of like it was just one more news article with horror. And and I thought, not only only have I overburdened, but I'm I'm no longer got feeling for the news and that's a concern as well. We grow up in this. Hope is dwindling. Surveys indicate that younger people have less hope than in any previous generation. And again, the media paint a picture that's grim. And for many of us, our long-term resilience and rationale balances that out. But think of a teenager today, and I know many of them are away at the camp. But a kid who's, you know, aged between 12 and 15 or 16, they're shaped by what they see in the media, Facebook, Instagram, the news and everything else. And they haven't had the opportunity or the ability to overcome, which builds resilience that many of us have. So when they read things, when they see things, it creates horror internally. It's like a fresh piece of paper and everything that's on the paper is grim. It's not hopeful. 
The, the media is not giving a picture of hope for young people. You know, just through the week, um, that young girl, Greta, I think she's 15 years old, telling off the old people in the UN. Now, many people are horrified that she responded the way that she did and I'm horrified for her because of the emotional state she's in. But you think about it, her story, her understanding is, is, is what she's derived from the media and the picture they're painting is, is one of no hope, no future. Is it any wonder that young people are taking their lives at higher rates than ever before despite our wealth? There's a challenge that we've got in the world around about us and stress and pressure and mental health issues are taking a toll that we need to do something about. When the church gathers, it should experience an atmosphere of encouragement. How many people feel encouraged by what I've said? Be honest, nobody. You didn't listen, mate. You you realise that. You You didn't listen, you're just smiling away thinking the world's a nice place. The reality is it's not encouraging it's not encouraging what's happening. It's downright depressing at times, but it's even more depressing for people who haven't built the resilience or the hope that will get through this. I mentioned my father-in-law, because he's gone through so much, there's this innate sense that we've overcome things before, we'll get through it again. Right? It doesn't mean you're not affected or horrified by something, but it's like, I, I will get through. We, we've, we've got through before and we'll get through again. But young people don't have that same feeling, same challenge. You know, our primary source of encouragement must must come from God because all other sources may well fail us. You know, people lose courage. All of us lose courage. We all lose hope and we all get tired. Some of you are tired this morning because you lost an hour of sleep, but that sort of tiredness um, dissipates quickly. It's the sort of tiredness from fighting battle after battle by, of carrying weight that we're not supposed to carry. It, it, it drains us. It, it, it removes the sense of vigour and excitement about life that ought to be a part of every single one of our lives. And some of you were sitting here and you're thinking, you know what, maybe I'm more affected by this than I actually think. And it's true. People, people's level of satisfaction ought, ought to be much higher given the circumstances we live in, but the world is pushing us down. It, 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 I, the enemy knows what he's doing. Yeah. You, you know, we, we talk about the church and how it grows in the midst of the persecution in developing countries and, and it grows. But in the West, the church is still in a state of decline. The enemy's work is to push us down. It's not to make us poor, it's to push us down, to remove hope. I want to read to you from 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 through 8. And then I want to address some things that arise out of that. Three days later, when David and his men arrived home at their town of Ziklag, they found that the Amalekites had made a raid into the Negev and Ziklag, and they'd crushed Ziklag and burned it to the ground. They'd carried off the women and the children and everyone else, but without killing anyone. And David and his men saw the ruins and realised what had happened to their families. They wept until they could weep no more. David's two wives, Anna home uh, from Jezreel and Abigail, the wife of Nabal from Carmel, were among those captured. David was now in great danger because all his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters. And they began to talk of stoning him. But David found his strength in the Lord his God. Then he said to Abiathar the priest, bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought it and David asked the Lord, shall I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? The Lord told him, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. The story is very simple. David and his men were out doing what they were doing, fighting a battle, fighting a war. And they'd fought for some time and uh, the time had come for them to return home. Now they would have been quite weary, uh, both as a result of the physical effort they'd gone to, they'd have been weary because they'd have been away from home for some time. And we don't know the emotional toll of fighting a battle, uh, a hand-to-hand battle like that would have taken on those men either. I, I, I know, you know, we've seen enough films and some of you have experienced war, but the 
the emotional toll of being in battle like that would have been significant. These men, as they're returning home, they would see in the distance the town where they lived, Ziklag, burning. Uh, you know, from the distance, they wouldn't have known what had happened, but they knew enough to know that it was, not, it was normal practice for everyone to be killed and for the town to be burned. That was, that was probably what they themselves had done. And in the distance, they knew the direction. They would have seen in the distance the smoke rising from their town, which would have increased their anxiety no end because the people they loved, everything they'd worked for were resident in that town and suddenly it was at, at, at least in danger, if not much, much worse. And they're, they're commuting, if you like, back to their village. They get back to their village tired from many battles. They find that the enemy had broken into their town and burned it to the ground. And when you think about losing everything that you have, it, it's, it's not so hard to imagine that in theory, but in practice for someone who has lost everything, it, 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 it's the big things, but it's the little things. It's the, it's the house that you lived in, the memories that were created. It's the, it's the toys that your children played with. It's the photos of your family. It's, the, it's the, the things you need to look after, like your birth certificate and your passport and and maybe money that you'd stashed in. Do you guys stash money in walls and pillows? But imagine if you can, if you, if you could, what it would be like for you to return home today. And I pray that that is not the case, but that everything is gone. And, and you know, if everything that you had, everything that you owned was gone and burned to the ground and that first thing you normally do is you look for your family. Is my mum here? Is she okay? She was elderly. It's so my baby son, is he still here? Is it, he's gone. I mean, the first thing they'd have done is they'd have rushed into the ruins looking for their families and, uh, and one part of them would have been relieved that they didn't find any bodies. Another part would have been horrified knowing that they'd all been taken, which may well be worse than them losing their lives. And the soldiers are experiencing this. The enemy had taken their women and children. And I say this, including David's wives and children as well. So David wasn't unaffected by this. He was equally affected. The Bible says they cried until they could cry no more. Now I've been with some people who've lost loved ones, have experienced difficult times and, and they weep and some of them weep deeply and, um, and, and you know most people who are weeping deeply as a result of grief reserve the, the depth of their grief for the privacy of their own home. And, and these men, these Grown, tough, murderous men. The Bible says they cried until they could cry no more. That says something about the exhaust, exhaustion they must have felt. Not only the physical exhaustion, not only the loss of hope because their town was destroyed, not only the, the fear and the concern and the worry for their families, but that, there, was, there was nothing left inside of them. It was like they become a shell of who they were simply because of all that they'd tolerated, all that they'd experienced and, 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 and hope was gone. It was like there was nothing left in the, in the barrel. It was, it was completely empty. And, and you know, emotionally, when people go through difficult times, this is what happens to them. They feel like they've got nothing left to give. It's like they get to a point of hopelessness where there is no point living any longer because of what they're suffering. And it doesn't matter, you know, for, for someone on the outside, perspective's always nice, but for someone who's gone through a difficult time, they lose perspective because all of their hopes are locked up in the thing that's been lost. And it's like, it doesn't matter anymore. And it's, that's the state these men are in. Soldiers, David's closest friends became embittered and they began to take it out on David, who was the leader. When we go through a period of grief, when we go through a tough time and we begin to grieve, what happens is we usually look for someone to blame. It's like people become a target for us. We're always looking for someone whose fault it is. And, you know, we ought not to be blame shifters. We need to stand up and take responsibility ourselves. That's a sideline. If it's, but what happens is when you're in the deepest depths of despair, you look for someone to take it out on. It's his fault. If, I, if he hadn't made church at nine, nine o'clock this morning, I wouldn't have had a car accident trying to get here. It's Sherrod, he should pay the insurance uh, excess. 
It's his hand. If, if church was at 9.30, it wouldn't have happened. Here's to blame. And you know, you can get the money off him later, but, <laughs> but the reality is when something goes wrong, whether rational or not, we look for someone to blame. And what you've got is these tough men, these warriors, uh, David's closest friends, having lost all hope, having lost everything that they had, they said, do you know what? This wouldn't have happened if David didn't take us to battle. We didn't need to go an extra day. We didn't need to go to that town. He took us there. He's the one to blame. And the Bible says they want to stone him. That's how angry they are. That's how mad they are. And the reason you go to angry when you're at empty is it's the only way you get energy. I, you need to understand that when you're empty and you need energy, you turn to anger because it comes up from within you. And we've got to watch that because it's destructive and it's usually misplaced. But, and that's the case here. As we read it through, it says, we find that David needed courage and he found it in the Lord. And the King James Version says, but David encouraged himself and the Lord is God. And you may say, what has this got to do with mental health issues? What has this got to do with the stress that we suffer? David is in a precarious position here. He is not only suffering loss the same as all of his friends, the same as the warriors, but on top of that, the very people that he considered closest to him have now turned on him and he is in, the worse, in, in a place worse than the rest of them. He can't turn to somebody else. He could have turned to God and blamed Him. And you know, when we go through hard times and we feel like hope is lost, too often what we do is we turn to God and we blame Him as irrational as it is. But David didn't do that. What he did was he turned to God. He had nowhere else to go. And the Bible says he found his strength in the Lord. The sad thing about this verse of Scripture is it doesn't tell us how he found strength in the Lord. And so I'm going to propose some ways that he did it that I think will give you some insight into what actually took place in David's experience. The first thing he did was he reminded himself about who God is. Whatever your circumstance, whatever your situation, whether you've lost your wife or your family, you've lost your job or you've gone bankrupt, God is still or is who He always was. He hasn't changed. He's still as omnipotent, omniscient. He, he, he's always loving. He's always full of grace. Whatever you're going through, He is always the same. And David, I, be, I believe, would have imagined that in himself. He would have said, God is still who He is. He hasn't changed. He's not affected by this. It's not like He has suddenly changed in character. The second thing I think David would have done, he would have reminded himself about what God had done in the past. In the deep, dark past, David would have been well-versed with the Israelite story. He would, have re- he would have remembered the story about how um, God had first of all spoken to Abraham and taken him to a foreign country. He would have remembered the stories about how um, Isaac came about because, and, and some of you say, how did he know that? There was oral tradition, the stories were passed on and eventually they were written down. But he would have remembered that God provided a son for Abraham and for Sarah. He would have remembered the Israelites and how they, their journey into Egypt, but he would have remembered their journey out of Egypt and how they defeated against all the odds, they defeated the Egyptians. Egyptians because God was on their side, not with mortal combat, but with a miraculous, miracle working power of God that drowned them all. You ought to remember the story of, uh, of Joshua and Jericho and the walls that come tumbling down, not in the strength of some men, but out of the response, uh, out of the response to God by obedient men. And, and David would have reminded himself of these past victories. He would have reminded himself about the call of God on his own life. David knew as a young man what it meant to be called to be the king of Israel. Remember when when all of his brothers despised him, he knew what it meant to be called by God. Despite the journey that he took, he remembered the call of God on his life. He would have reminded himself about as yet unfulfilled promises, things that he knew were coming into the future. His dynasty was gonna last forever. There were 
things that were yet to be done that were still undone. And all of this began to build up, if you like, inside of David's mind. It's God's still there. He's done this in the past. He called me to this. He's got things in the future that He's still yet to do. And, and this was beginning to, uh, if you like, come to bear in David's mind. He would have remembered the fight with the lion as a young boy. He would have remembered the fight with the bear as a young boy. He would have remembered the challenge of Goliath to the armies of Israel and how he was bad-mouthing the Israelites. And David remembered picking up the stones, walking out and then eventually taking Goliath's head off. I mean, David might have been sad, but as he began to think about God and who he is and what God had done for him and what he'd experienced, he heard from God again. Too often when we're in the midst of despair, when we're, when we're finding things difficult, we blame God rather than listening to God. And, and, and there are other times where we're saying, well, God is just not speaking. Well, God has already spoken. You don't need to hear an audible voice to get out of the hole that you're in. You need to recall your experience with Him already. The Bible is full of stories that will encourage your faith. As a matter of fact, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. In other words, as we look at what God has done in the past, something happens on the inside and generates excitement and faith and belief again. And David heard from God again for himself in that circumstance. But the circumstance hadn't changed. There were still murderous men looking to take his life. What I think he did finally was this, he spoke it out. He probably shouted it out and he rallied his men about his belief in God and their ability to overcome again. I did this before, but he, I can see him moving from person to person. Remember what, what we did to those Philistines that day? You and I, side by side. I killed them. You watched in horror. I looked after you. I saved you. I organised your marriage. He would have got alongside the men that were wanting to kill him, looked them in the eyes, placed his hand on their shoulder and said, we can do this again. Yeah. We've fought battles before. They've been tough battles, but we can do it again. We'll get through this. I, I'm not going to Ray. <laughs> Lance, how many times did we save Sheridan, you and I? I mean, you know, the guy's still in need of salvation. <laughs> We've done it before, mate. We can do it again. I know you've had some tough times. I, you know, I've lost my wife, you've lost yours. But the only way you're going to get your wife back, the only way I'm getting, is if you and I go together. I, I know you don't love me now. As a matter of fact, I know you and Sheridan are planning to stone me. You can stone me if you like, but it won't get your wife back. But I tell you what, if you don't stone me, if you stand with me, if you, if you give it one last shot, take what's inside of you and fight with me, we'll get your wife back. We'll get your kids back, yours as well. And what he would have done is he went face to face to those murderous men and he gathered them and he encouraged them and he helped them believe again. And when they believed again, we know the end of the story is they went and they recovered what was lost. How does this relate to where I started? There are people all around you who need you to do what David did. There are people in your workplace, Christians or other Christians or not, makes no difference, but they need somebody to encourage them. And the only way you encourage them is by using your mouth. You know, David could have gone through all of those first points, but unless he spoke it out, it wouldn't have made any difference. And all around you, there are people who need you to speak words of encouragement in their circumstance. I'm not saying you need to quote Scripture to them because some of the people you choose to encourage won't be Christians and, and you'll just come out as weird. But simply walking across to a person in the workplace and say, hey, I know, I know you're doing it tough, buddy, but I just want to let you know, I'm thinking if I can help in any way, I'm happy to help. So that makes a significant difference to a person in the workplace, doesn't need to be weird and Christian. But what you're actually doing is you're transferring some courage you've got and you're saying, take some of mine, use some of my courage and together we can get through this. It's surprising the difference that will make. We, want, we know Jesus is the hope of the world, but the world doesn't know that He is the hope of the world. As a matter of fact, sometimes in the midst of the challenges we face, we don't know that He's the hope of the world. But what can make the difference is if you and I together determine to make the church a place of encouragement. 
You may say, well, I don't have the words. I'm not eloquent. I, I don't know what to say. It doesn't matter what you say as long as you convey what you feel. Children convey words to adults and they do it in stumbling and funny ways. But adults derive a sense of um, gratitude out of the efforts of a child. It doesn't matter if it's, uh, if it's not articulate. What matters is what they're feeling. Can I say to you, whatever your ability or inability is, all you've got to do is attempt to share with somebody else the courage you have and it'll make a difference in their life. Now, the ideal thing is that we're all in such a great place that we can focus and spend our time and encourage one another. But the reality is some of you today will feel like David. You'll feel like everyone's out to kill you, like the world's against you, like God doesn't care and that there is no one to encourage you. Can I push you and say, find your strength in the Lord, just like David did? Take the time, put in some effort, Remind yourself about who God is, about His love for you and about what He's done in the past and let Him speak to you through the testimony of your history so that hope can rise again for you and you can push through the challenge of your current experience. I know there's some horrific things that people go through and some of them they go through for the rest of their life, but courage or the encouragement of another makes it just that little bit easier to get through. I've got a a friend at church, I think, he's, I think he's 87 now, I forget his age. And I remember when we first started the church some 21 years ago, he came to me and he said, I, I want to be a prayer partner for you. I want to let you know that I'm going to be praying for you every day. And he's done that ever since. So it's about 21, 22 years he's been doing this. But a few years back, he lost his wife. His wife suffered a stroke and she died and... Um, you know, I know we could describe marriages this way, but for him, it's like they were two, the two had become one. The hole that it left in his life remains. And he still struggles some, all these years later. But what helps him is the encouragement he gets from others around about. And there are people living with holes in their life that need your encouragement to keep going. It doesn't mean the, the pain that they feel will just suddenly dissipate, but knowing there's others standing together with them will make a difference. You hold within yourselves the power to change somebody else's life. The only thing stopping you is your decision to act. I said earlier on, you know, we talk about the community. The community here in Hamilton is about 150,000 people. When we talk about changing the community, we think, oh, it's just too big. Your community is this. It's your friends, your families, your work colleagues, your neighbours. Maybe 60 or 70 people. And, and in a normal week, you may only connect with maybe 20 or so people. What I want to encourage you to do is to think about some of those 20 or so people and say, God, who is it that needs my encouragement this week? What can I say that will help them get through? You don't need to counsel them. All they're looking for is a little bit of strength. Maybe a work colleague and you know they're just going through a tough time, you don't know why. And what you can do is phrase it in an appropriate way and say, hey, listen, it just, I, it just seems that like things have been tough for you lately, lads. So I just wanna let you know um, I'm standing with you. If I can do anything to help you get through this, I'm happy to help. I don't need to know the details. just want to let you know I'm here. I'm happy to help if I can. We've all got the power to do that. And God knows the world that we live in needs it. Our young people need your encouragement more than ever before. And it's appropriate that they're not here this morning. Because if I can, I want to implore you to encourage them. Go out of your way to do your very best to encourage them because they need your hope. They don't have the resilience you have because of the battles that you fought. Our words will make a significant difference. We can make a difference in the process we'll point to Jesus. Will you stand together with me this morning? I'm gonna pray and whether you feel like you're David or whether you feel like you're one of the other soldiers, no matter what your circumstance, 
If you focus on encouraging somebody else, God will also encourage you. Father, I pray today. We live in challenging times. You know that, we know that, and we are in a battle. Sometimes the battle is a spiritual battle. There are other times where it's just practical things that go wrong and we're challenged by those things. But all around us, there are people who are suffering stress, more stress than they can handle at times. Enable us, Father, equip us with words that could make a difference for somebody around us so that when they're running a race, our words enable them to reach the finish line. So when they're going through a tough time in their relationship or in their workplace, our words will give them the strength that they need to endure to the end. Lord, help us to see or to discern accurately those around us who need a word of encouragement so that it can make a difference for them and get them through to the end. Father, we want to be like Jesus whenever and wherever we are. This is one way, Father, that I know that we can create hope for those who are perhaps in a moment or a time where they're feeling hopeless. Enable us to touch the lives of others, I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.